I'm Peter Brown from Tiny and Sons Glass. Tiny and Sons Glass was established in 1978 when my father and brother and I were at 575 Washington Street in Pembroke. We're certified and qualified to do all your windshield replacement and repair. Tiny and Sons Glass is a community-based business. We have 12 mobile vans that come to you. If the weather's bad, you can come here to the shop. We have a nice waiting area, TV, Wi-Fi, kid-friendly, pet-friendly. We also can move about 15, 20 cars a day through the shop. Perfect for you when the weather's bad. So come on down to Tiny and Sons Glass if you need your windshield replaced or repaired. Tiny and Sons Glass, 1-888-64-TINYS. Just call. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It is 5 p.m. Monday, March the 12th. We are going to begin our Board of Health meeting. I would like to begin by reading the Chair's statement. Please note that this meeting is being made available to the public through an audio recording, which will be used to ensure an accurate record of proceedings produced in the minutes of this meeting. All comments made in open session will be recorded. Okay, so we have a couple of guest speakers coming in, one at 5.15 and one at 5.45. It's now a few minutes after 5, so I thought we would begin with our health agent's report. All of you should have the written report in your packages. Mm -hmm. Mr. Newman, you have yours? Yes, sir. Ms. McSweeney? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, I'll lead off if you'd like, Mr. Chairman. Please. Um, continuing to be monitored is the field house. Um, the secretary took a phone call, and um, at this point in time, the owner operator of the field house has said he has left a deposit. Um, as of approximately Wednesday, when the installer last came in, he said he had not received a deposit as yet to get to work, so perhaps there's a check crossed in the mail there. I've been periodically going by due to concerns at the facility. I have not found anything out of place. I have advised the operator of the facility to uh, attempt to keep the bathroom tra trailer in better order um, be based on complaints, but the, the allegations of overflowing, water pouring out, um, waste matter of any kind were not found in evidence on any of my inspections. Um, the trailer is outside. It is inconvenient, but it is not unsafe to use. It is not unsanitary to use. It does have electricity, hot water, um, and things of that nature. So moving along, Pembroke Hospital still has plans in front of DEP. They are finalized. Hopefully, um, shortly those will be approved so that they can begin their installation. It was their goal to begin installation by the end of this month. That might be pushed back to April, largely due to the weather. Um, office activity is greatly increased. It's obvious that everyone thinks it's spring, although the weather seems to disagree with us lately. Um, a lot more people coming in, getting licenses, getting prepared to do work, a lot more property coming on, being listed, being rehabbed. Um, some areas of concern, um, we did some checkups on some vacant property. 18 Monroe has been vacant for quite some while. I was called out again by Pembroke Police. Um, to, to validate that that wasn't still, in fact, a condemned piece of property not fit for habitation. It is not. Um, we had some property concerns with access at 45 Ridge Avenue. Again, I was asked to investigate. There is a, uh, an issue from a public right-of-way to traverse to get on to Ridge Avenue. That is not a problem for the Board of Health. It's just a, a land court ownership issue, but I investigated. Um, we had some perk tests this week. Let's see, I'm just scrolling through before I get to the, to the big one, which is the storm, um, which ate up a lot of our time and resources. Um, Taylor Point Road is resolved. There's a dispute between Columbia Gas and the property owner as to who is to pay for what repairs. Again, not an issue for the Board of Health, um, but advise the, the property owner that that uh, property is not fit for human habitation as well, and that if they decide to put in a new well, which is at their choice, that that should be a licensed well installer. Uh, the board should keep in mind we still is have... Is this at Taylor Point? You're Taylor still Point, talking 56, about? 50, 56 Taylor Point Road, correct. That that home is not suitable for habitation. There okay. are not services on at that home. That home was not suitable for habitation years ago. It has a uh, failed cesspool. It is 30 that. feet from uh, Oldham Pond. If I could just interject sure. for a second. Um, that home sold in 2017. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm wondering how it went through without the title file. It was probably from parent to child. It yes. was a home belonging to Hildegard Clem, and it sold to her son, Robert, I believe. Peter. Peter, Peter. Peter I'm sorry, wrong, wrong Clem. There's two of them. But from parent to son, a title five inspection is not required under Massachusetts general laws. 
Uh, still doesn't make it suitable for human occupation, though. The, the fact that it has a failed cesspool 30 feet from the borders of Oldham Pond is not a race just because no, of No, I'm understanding that. I was just un yeah. trying to understand the sale of the sure. home and the Title V not blood being Blood relative to blood it. relative, it, it is allowed. It is an exemption allowed under Title V. Uh, 58 Woodbine, uh, the board still is at some point going to want to take up that with the allegation, which is substantiated by the information in our files. Uh, it was specifically specced out by the previous agent that that uh, metal tank was to be removed and replaced as a part of the upgrade to the home, and that has not occurred. Uh, the installation permit sits in our, in our file. Uh, the installer I've confirmed with, he did not do the work that was indicated on that form. So that takes care of our routine items. Then we get into, of course, our lovely storm. Um, uh, Chief Hill called for an activation of a shelter at the Pembroke Public Library at 7 p.m. We are open and operational by 8 p.m. The first evening we did not have overnight guests, although we did have two walk-ins with medical needs for electricity. They stayed for a while. I believe they departed by midnight. Um, the shelter remained in operation when the library was not. The library was on extended hours, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., operating as a library and warming station, and then would switch over to shelter activities every night from 8 p.m. till the following 8 a.m. So we would set up cots every night. We would pick them up every morning. We had uh, nursing staff on hand both at night and in the morning so that if there was any need for intake or evaluation, we could do that. And also as people woke up, they were evaluated, and then that nurse would switch over to the COA to make sure that anyone coming in there at 8.30 in the morning was requiring more assistance than they needed. Um, that they were available for that. Um, some some points to know that, um, needless to say, I worked throughout the weekend quite extensively as well as into the week. I did not, while well, we stood down our shelter, Tuesday morning I was still assisting um, some residents at risk um, to restore safe uh, occupation of their homes throughout the day Tuesday. Luckily that did finally occur by 6 p.m. We were able to confirm that a family in question was able to be safely in their home and were Excuse me, one senior, I checked her home personally to make sure she was safe to return home. Uh, at that time, that took care of our at-risk population um, that was of, of the most care needed, shall we say, during the event. Um, from that point on, we were able to move into more normal um, operations. I have not finished the after-action report. It will be extensive. Um, a lot of people are, are quick to say National Grid, it was a horrible failure. What people don't understand and uh, became obvious the more it was being worked on, is it's not that National Grid haven't had an enormous failure. It was that it wasn't safe for them to even get to work up in the bucket trucks until the wind subsided. And then on top of that, the trunk line from Bridgewater to the Pembroke, Hanover, Hanson, Halifax area was in shambles. And that had to be repaired before they could even begin restoration work um, in Pembroke. So that extra day that we saw was, was of time was eaten up by the wind events being so severe that they couldn't work. And then the fact that the trunk line was down, and without that trunk line available, um, power outage could not be restored to Pembroke at all. Um, COA helped us with um, uh, assessing at-risk citizens, making a lot of phone calls, checking on people. The Pembroke Housing Authority deserves a lot of credit as well. They were checking on their population. The generators in their common spaces worked beautifully. I was told, and I quote from the housing director, it was almost like a party there every day. Uh, there was karaoke and board games and potluck dinners amongst residents, and apparently anyone who wanted to be warm and safe in that common area could do so. So that was a huge burden off our resources. Um, no, no severe problems with people being trapped in homes that we are aware of. Checks were done. No one was left unassisted that I am aware of, and as, as far as I know as of today, unless I'm mistaken, neither of the chiefs are aware of that either, which means we, we as a town responding to our citizens' need did a pretty, pretty darn good job. There was no one out there looking for help that didn't, didn't uh, receive it. So does the board have any questions for me? Mr. Newman? I had the chance to go by the shelter, and I thought it was well run. I just wanted to let you know that. Um, I was able. To, I've been there. Went there more than once. I helped load in some of the food from the food pantry. Um, I stopped in at nighttime to see how they were doing. And um, I was let's back up a little bit to the Perfect. field house, uh, yeah. Ms. Landy. If you could put on the agenda two weeks from this evening, I'd like to get Mr. Poria here for an update. Okay, I'm, I'm not running the field house, and it's, it's not for me to say that it's moving along slower than I'd, I'd like to see, but I would like to have a conversation with him and uh, get an updated report. Okay? 
Lisa, can we just go back to 56 Taylor Point? Certainly. If I might, and I may have mis misunderstood you. Did you say at the beginning when you started talking about that that the situation has been resolved? As far as now, it's between the gas company and the homeowner who is pursuing whatever they wish to in court as far as money. Um, there was friction between the homeowner and the gas company, which led him here regarding how much repair work uh, the gas company was responsible for, who was responsible to fix the well, who was permissible to fix the well. Um, there's a dispute going between them of, of just how much work has to be done. That's not an issue before this board. The only thing that's an issue before this board is if someone is going to replace the entire well, that that, that person needs to be a licensed installer. Um, that issue was clarified. There was also um, uh, statements made by National Grid as well as um, forgive me, the well installation company that came forward that may or may not be working on the property, that there was a renter at this home that now, of course, had no water, no power, and some other issues. And I needed to, to make sure that that homeowner understood that that was not appropriate. That home is not suitable for human occupation. It is a cesspool within 30 feet of Oldham Pond. It is an automatic Title V failure. Regardless of the gas, regardless of the water, that home is not suitable for habitation until that is fixed. To the best of your knowledge, is the renter in the home now? My understanding is they are not. I went out to physically confirm. I did not see evidence of a person living in that home at this time. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. 58 Woodbine. At our meeting two weeks ago, we were given 58 Woodbine was part of the health agent's report. Our health agent was not present at the time, and I had instructed Miss Landy to send a letter to the homeowner of Woodbine, and I'm just inquiring if that has been done, Sheila? Not yet, Mr. Fine. Okay, you think that will be done this week? Yes, it will, Mr. Fine. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, okay. And I do apologize to the board. I hope you understand. I know it's you, you got an overview. If you understood how many hours are, are hijacked by emergency management type activities when we go into that mode, Literally, Sheila spent two nights at the shelter. I spent one overnight at the shelter. I was there every evening till 10 or 11 ish, and there every morning for a minimum of four hours, um, deploying staff, making sure everyone had everything they needed to do their jobs. Um, so I know that's a huge interruption to, to this office, but I hope you understand that when something like that happens, that has to be the top priority, and I would hope would be the top priority for this town. Yeah. In in no way, shape, or form was was that point. No, I'm just, I'm just that was an inquiry. You know. And Sheila put in easily. 40 to 50 hours this weekend. I probably had more than that because um, no that's what it yeah. <laughs> That's because she was a zombie Tuesday morning and I sent her home after spending most of an overnight up. I told her to leave because she was exhausted. You know, some sometimes as, as chair of the board, I get to speak first and other times I will go last and defer to my other board members. So in this case, I'm last. So Mr. Newman, you had an opportunity to go over your experiences about going over the shelter, seeing what was going on over there. So I get to go last, but I would say I would unequivocally reiterate everything that you just said. I spent some time over there Monday evening. I was in touch with our health agent and Mrs. Landy throughout the storm. You guys were giving me updates, and I did not spend an evening there. But for those folks who did, and I'm talking about those folks perhaps in the town administrator's office or anyone in town, be it the selectmen, I think the town of Pembroke really pulled together. I know living on Monroe Street, I was one of the last streets to get power back on, and it was difficult. And, and I think, you know, the town did a great job hanging in there. I'm sure there were many examples of neighbors helping neighbors. So I, think so I, well. I, I applaud the whole town. I think town. people really stepped up all over the place. And uh, I, I think that, once again, the town has proven its staff and its resources are, um, are some of the strongest that are available. Good. Thank you. Good evening, folks. And please, don't hesitate to reach out by email or text message phones. We're very unreliable during this event. Please text me if you have a question. I'm more than happy to answer it at any time. Thanks. I do have my cell phone. I do. I put it to my contacts. Thanks for the phone. Thank you. Okay. So it is a few minutes after 515. We've got a few folks coming in to speak. I believe they're in our hallway right now. I think she'll we just went together. Mm -hmm. 
show you how to look at the camera. I give all kinds of surprises to them. Hi, folks. Want to have a seat? So we are joined this evening. We have two individuals coming into the room. We have Patrick Chilcott, Chairman of the School Committee, and Aaron Obi, the Superintendent. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having us. I actually <coughs> reached out to Mr. Chilcott over the weekend. I became aware of an incident that occurred in the schools, and I asked Mr. Chilcott and Aaron to come before the board and kind of give us a little synopsis and some thoughts about what transpired. So I'll turn the floor over to you folks. Sure. Sure. So um, we were notified, I was notified on Wednesday that we had a um, Board of Health member that wanted to come into the schools um, and had visited the high school north in Habermas, which is perfectly fine. You're more than welcome anytime at our schools. Um, Unfortunately, when school is in session, which at the high school school was about to start, um, there were students there. Anytime there's a visitor in the building, we need them to check in with the office because those visitors need to have a quarry check and need to be escorted around the building. That didn't happen um, on Wednesday. In addition to that, um, the Board of Health member identified themselves as in, in, there to do an inspection. So I had some questions just around um, that piece of it because generally we hear from Lisa. Um, she works with Nadine, our food service manager, when there's going to be an inspection in the kitchen just because of the nature of the work that we do and the fact that there's generally children in the building. Um, on top of that, um, some of the cafeteria managers were asked to sign something. Um, our cafeteria employees don't have signatory authority in our buildings. It has to be a building representative, a building administrator, um, our food service manager, or our, our um, facilities director. Um, so we were just, I'm just interested in clarifying the purpose of the visit. We are more than happy to have you at any time visit our schools, um, but we just want to make sure that you're following our protocol as far as entering the building and walking around with an escort and then the purpose of that visit. I am aware of the, um, of checking in with this, the receptionist and all receptionists on all three schools brought me to the caf cafeteria at the um, open window. Um, my questions were, and they were very simple, how did we run while the schools are going? I knew how we did in 2010, but everybody was doing their own thing. My interest was, did we have generators? And that was the question I asked, and if we had been inspected. I wrote down the times, that I spoke to these people and I asked them to initial because I was there. I identified myself as an elected official and a Board of Health member. I did no inspections. There was nothing out of protocol. Mm -hmm. so they were shown a badge and so just to clarify our staff and, and I do have a badge. I have a Board of Health member badge which says that I am an elected official. So and uh, I clarified that with them. So unfortunately, either what you clarified or what you communicated um, wasn't communicated effectively enough. Um, the reality of this situation as it currently stands, and I don't think Aaron and I would have ever indicated that it was you individually. Uh, we were just talking as uh, individual health board of health members. There is a protocol to follow. There is a required protocol to follow. Um, all three schools that were visited um, have given witness statements to the Pembroke Police indicating that the protocol that you just mentioned was not followed, that there was no checking that was done, that the individual that entered the schools did so with students, um, showed up at the cafeteria, started to inquire at the cafeteria as to a variety of questions, everything from, as you just mentioned, generator back up to the loss of power, the last loss of power. On top of that, in at least I'm one... I'm going to stop you right there. Excuse me. For a second, point, of order, point of order, can you let... Could, I, could I finish what he's talking about right point now? Point of order, Mr. Chilcott. Please let but, Mr. Chilcott finish. You'll have an opportunity to speak. And, and, and I do think it's, it's fair just to make sure that everything's clear that, um, that uh, Mrs. McSweeney has an opportunity to, to speak. But I, just I do think it's... It, the other issue is one of the... One of the, in at least one of the three schools, they indicated that it was a health inspector. They, it was referred to as a health inspector was coming to do an inspection and asked the types of questions like an inspector would ask. I think as Aaron said, and it's really important because I think this is really important for all of us to understand, 
is a team of town government in doing this together. If any of you guys ever want to enter the schools, if any of you have any questions, if you have any concerns whatsoever about whether or not something's being followed, the protocols being followed, that type of thing, we are all open and more than willing to have a conversation about that, number one. But the other thing that I, I'm concerned about, and to be clear, we as a committee haven't spoken about this. Um, I'm here as the um, sitting chairman um, on behalf of Pembroke Public Schools and the kids, but I think it's also important that one of the requests was um, prior inspections, prior inspection, inspection certificates, files, data, information around those. Those are all things that are very specific that an individual cafeteria manager or a cafeteria worker would not just kind of be pulling out. So it seems pretty clear based on reading the report um, of the Pembroke Police today that the requirements and the requests were far more detailed than someone with a question or, or, or two. And the fact that all three of the sitting um, folks at the front desk did not see the individual, did not escort the individual, um, and that a badge was then shown when that individual got there, whether it's there or not, concerns me. Right? In order to enter the school with children there, you must have a quarry. And you must be quarry checked. And I you must be escorted. Mr. Chilcott, I don't know who you spoke to, but I went to every office. I went to the office at the beginning of the school. I know the protocols very well. And I was escorted to each cafeteria. Um, I have the names of the people that took me there. Mm -hmm. so, and I have the times. Okay. My only questions to the cafeteria people, I never went into temperatures or storage or anything. I asked them how we ran during the power outage if we had generators so, in the building. So it here's my question. Just, well, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. I'm sorry. Totally. Go ahead. All right. Uh, that's the only thing. And I also asked them if we had been inspected yet. Those were the only two questions I asked. We have five schools in this town. Mm -hmm. The Board of Health, the onus lays on the Board of Health. We might have a Department of Municipal Inspections, but when the bottom dollar comes down, the Board of Health is the one that, that's responsible for the public safety in this town. So in now, certainly under an emergency situation, okay. you would want to know, I know I was asked by residents, telling them I have no idea is not a good idea, it's not a good answer, to the residents. Um, I didn't relay any information any further. I did this so that I knew where we were in the Board of Health, knowing we had an upcoming meeting, and there were no violations. So so one of the things, and no, it's, this is important to out, right? Just even if I were willing, which I'm not based on the report that I saw, say that everything that you just said to me was factual, you would still be on such shaky ground in a violation of the position, in my opinion, that candidly, I, I can't believe that you just told me that that's what you did. A protocol is followed between government officials and between government entities. I get asked questions all the time about what's happening in town with the Board of Selectmen. I've been asked a multitude of questions about what's happening with your board and the multitude of things that have been ongoing with your board over the last several months. Not only do I not opine on it, but if I have a specific question that requires more detail, I call your chairman or I would call one of you, quite honestly, with, with no issue. And I mean, we don't know each other a, a whole lot. We haven't had a whole lot of dealings, but even if you couldn't call me, you could call Mrs. Obi. I would never just walk into it's like getting a question on the police station and just showing up and walking into a police station to do a visual inspection or ask questions about the cells or prisoner treatment or anything else. Not only can I not do that, do I have no right to do that, candidly, nor do you. If you have a question, a specific question about the schools, the upkeep of the schools, we actually do have a health inspector in town that can, you can, through your meeting as an elected board, charge that person with doing an inspection, and they would follow the known protocol and the required protocol for entering the building, performing the inspection, and everything else, or you would reach out and contact one of us. That is the appropriate means of communication. Showing up unannounced, walking into a building without having checked in, given the amount of security issues and fear that people currently have inside a school system, is, is just nothing more than, than candidly, 
it's, it's just insane. I, I don't know why we would do that out of the blue. That makes no sense to me. And well, I think my question, I guess, the bottom line question is, why did you feel the need to do that as opposed to reaching out and following a proper channel? I could channel? have easily answered your question about the generator power at all five of our buildings in one conversation. I was following under the Board of Health guidelines on what I have been doing. So, right? And in the guidelines, that's explicit, explicitly what it states. You're telling me that the guidelines to your, to your board, which by the way, it's not law, it's not laws of the Commonwealth, it is not laws of this town, but you're telling me that you have a written handbook on how to appropriately operate as a Board of Health member that you've reviewed and that that tells you to show up to a school unannounced, walk in unescorted, not announce yourself, and then say that you are there to perform an inspection as a health inspector? I did. First of all, you're, you're saying words that are not true. I never went in as a health inspector. So what would be the purpose of showing your badge? To identify who I was on the Board of Health. I'm a member. I am an elected official. So you I represent the residents, the taxpayers. And I'm sure the taxpayers want to know what's going on. Have they inspected or have they not? So now this is where this meeting is going to information. So in order to open school, we need a health inspection and a fire inspection. Just basic. correct. So school's open. It's working, which means we've had an inspection. But you got your inspection two, three days after the school's open. Why? So the Pembroke Police. I'm just going to put this to bed right here and now. The Pembroke Police in their official report to the superintendent of schools said, I spoke with the front desk personnel at Pembroke High School and checked their logs where you are required to sign in. And they checked the logs at every school from 3718. No one had entered the building and signed in as the name, is the name? From the Board of Health. Sorry, from the Board of Health. Thank you. I'm trying to follow protocol as best I can. She states that yesterday at approximately 0700 hours, the Board of Health member um, approached her in the cafeteria and stated she was from the Board of Health and showed her a badge signifying the same. That was at the that was at Pembroke High School. That's Barbara. At 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 Hubbard Elementary School at 1015 hours, I went to the Hubbard Elementary School and conducted the same interview process as stated above. There was no signed entry log at Hubbard High School for the Board of Health member. I then spoke to the cafeteria manager, Robin Johnson, who stated that that same member came to the Hubama cafeteria yesterday at 0720 hours and identified herself as a health inspector from Pembroke and showed her a badge's identification. Ma'am, either your recollection is so far afoul from what three different individuals have recalled or it's selective in a way that candidly, I, I just don't know if you didn't understand what you were doing. Mr. Chilcott, um, if there was a failure of signing in, then I would think your staff would say you need to sign in rather than directing me to All the cafeteria. three schools? You're telling me that there is, that, so you are telling was, me, then, then you are telling me that protocol wasn't followed at all three schools, that all three schools neglected to have you sign in. You're telling me then that three individuals lied to a Pembroke policeman as he was performing an inquiry, and that then three other individuals within the cafeteria also have it wrong, or you're not being truthful to me. Or you've just kind of misconstrued the truth. I just read to you what the Pembroke police told me. Well, Mr. Chilcott, I was there. I know exactly what happened, and I know what my, what my limitations were. I never jumped over my limitations. Um, I am extremely offended by you keep telling me I represented myself as a health agent. I have never done so and never will do so. I ran honestly for this board. I am working for the taxpayers. And bottom line, my concern is why did we open five schools without inspecting them prior? Why did we wait three days? So three, three days from when? Exactly. From the time the school opened. After the storm or in the fall? We're talking about the storm. Uh, so we have generator powers at our school that generate every one of our refrigerators, every one of our walk-in freezers. Those generators kicked on instantly with the storm. Lisa is aware of that. Lisa constantly checked in with our food service manager, Nadine, 
as far as the status of our buildings and that our generators were working. There was constant maintenance staff on site throughout the storm, making sure that the generators had gas and were continuing to power. Um, I don't know what your backlog of inspections looks like or how long it would take to get through every establishment in the town of Pembroke after the storm, but I'm concerned that you only went to three of the five schools. If that was your intent, was to make sure that we were that everything was inspected, you've only visited three of the five. I have a job, and that's all the time I had to do before I had to go to work. So, uh, but, but if you weren't there to provide the inspection, I'm just... I did not inspect the schools. No, I inquired as to how the schools ran during the storm. So why didn't you, you call the, the superintendent of schools? You thought the staff in the cafeteria... It was in my right to go in and ask. No, it Who actually is it? isn't. It absolutely isn't. Well, Mr. Chilcott, you can do what you want with that, but um, it's it's Mr. my Chairman, understanding. Through you, uh, I have a question. Yes, Mr. Uh, Newman. Thank you. We, as a board, uh, aren't we the policy makers? We have paid people that do inspections, meaning this, the health agent plus a couple of inspectors. Yeah. Uh, to your point, Mr. Newman, we are a policy making board. Yeah. Um, and I do appreciate. Patrick and Aaron coming in. Clearly, I was not present when these incidents yeah. happened, and clearly there's some different set of facts going on here, and I'm going to address that in just a minute. But to answer your question, uh, in the four years that I have been on the board, I myself, I think I know what goes on in the health inspection. I have actually gone out to establishments with our health agent. I could never adequately perform a health inspection, even though I have gone along with them. In my estimation, the way that you just phrased it, it is our job as a policy-making board to probably not go along on inspections, and I would have our health agent, Lisa Cullity, go out and do that. Um, one of the things that I have said since I became acting chair, I have used the phrase that we are an autonomous board. Now, people can take that and, and run with it and... You know, for me, an autonomous board means that we are a policy-making board, and we need to act as unison. I don't believe that I would go out and do something without the consensus of Ms. McSweeney or you, despite you being fairly new. I would, I would never have gone into the schools, period, number one. Number two, I would never have gone into the schools without having a discussion with, with my fellow board members. So there's a little dispute of facts here. And what I would like to do, I see the Chief of Police here. You may or may not, Chief, be able to speak on the investigation. I don't know if that would be improper, but if, if you have any light that you'd like to share on the matter, you're welcome to speak. Well, the report is, again, I didn't take the report, so one step beyond what the information was. But the intent was that a, uh, a badge was used to indicate that you know, a person had authority from the Board of Health. And that's my big concern right now because we work with the schools to provide security. Now, a badge with an ID card is useless. Anybody could take that badge and say whatever they want to say. And again, I have an issue with uh, elected boards and, and people that aren't police, that aren't firefighters, that aren't inspection people having badges. I, I just. There's, there's an issue with that because the authority that a badge does and a lot of times in most people's minds that trumps everything else sometimes it trumps their own protocols and it, it's too recognizable as authority and people don't usually ask for backup identification from the police we have it but we also wear uniforms but even the detectives have to carry a state ID card with them so a badge on its own is, is a dangerous thing to have and I don't think, as policymakers, there's a need for them. And just so you know, Chief, the badges are on the agenda this evening, so I will be discussing so that. But just, I, just, just so you know how common something can be, that's that's a police badge, and that's a Board of Health badge. Again, that, it, it, I would say the same thing with the Board of Selectmen. I don't see the need for that. I can only see that that's going to confuse people. And our job in the government is to be as transparent as possible. I would much rather see all of the board members and all of the town employees have an official ID card that says town, you know, Massachusetts and Pembroke in there and they have all that on there because that is something with a your picture on it that's actually an identification. That is not. You could take that police badge and go out and use it. I wouldn't know the difference. And I probably wouldn't ask. Well, I would. 
but most people wouldn't. As far as the report goes and everything else, my issue is with school security, and there was definitely a breach in school security. Because the, the, something like that, the school needs to know when somebody's going to the school. This was not such a priority that it was an emergency situation that somebody had to go into that school right away. It was an imminent danger that that needed, that protocols needed to be violated. So we need to address that. We need to make sure that that doesn't happen because it's one of the biggest concerns that we have and that we deal with all the time is how do we keep students in and other people out and when they do come in, following the protocol. Clearly. So regardless of the facts, we have some issues, ground ball issues that need to be taken care of. May I ask you a couple of questions just Maybe. for our understanding too? Was there a vote of the board asking for some sort of review or was there a concern that was addressed as you as a team, you as a board, to say that you know you were concerned that there was a health issue in one of the kitchens at the school? Okay. Perhaps, perhaps I wasn't clear when I was addressing Mr. Newman's question. If I wasn't, I apologize. There were, to the best of my knowledge, there was zero concern zero discussion, zero, zero consensus with regards to the safety of any of the food items, perishable items in the school. I have not done a health inspection in the school. I'm aware that four of the five, five of the schools all have generators, and I'm aware that four of them were up and running perfectly, for lack of a better term. And there was one of the generators that there were maybe some issues, but Nadine, I don't know her last name, yeah, forgive me, mm -hmm. Nadine and our health agent, Mrs. Cullity were, were working yeah. on that and being in communication. But during the storm, Mr. Chilcott, there was no concern as a board about the perishable items or the generators in the school. Mr. Fine, I'm going to have to correct you on that. I sent you an email inquiring as to the schools and what was being done. You responded with the fact that you were out of town and you were not. The emails, a board of health email, you responded with the fact that you had no idea because you have been busy with the storm yourself. I responded to the office also about what was going on with the food issue. I, got, I did not get the same, not get an answer as well. Okay, so there are two people in this office that I contacted to this prior to going to the schools to seeing what is actually, whether or not we did have generators. As a board, we should all be appraised on this. Another thing I would like to see is when we have an outage like this, something going on, I would like to see on the web page the places that are inspected so that our residents know what has been safe, and what is now declared safe, and what is not. We need a lot more transparency to okay, this. Okay, a couple of points. Uh, number one is McSweeney. That would be a topic for a future discussion in terms of a future storm, how to deal with an incident. But to your point, I received an email from you at 10 p.m. on Monday evening. I responded to you that you would be hearing directly from our administrator, Sheila Landy, and I directed Sheila to respond to you the next morning. I did not say to you that I was out of town, and I was on top of the situation as best that I can in communicating with our health agent and Mrs. Landy. Mrs. Landon, if you please pull that email. So we're we're going to move we're going to move forward. So can I can I ask just that, just one, one one other question, um, just from and if I if I may for you to Mr. Thorne, who's the head of the Department of Municipal Inspections, was there was there a concern or was there a worry or was there an action that the Department of Municipal Inspections has to be taken if it didn't come from the board? The answer is no. No. So the reality here is so the facts that cannot possibly under any circumstance be disputed is as a board of health, as a unified body, an elected body, a majority of that elected body cannot direct any one individual or any one member to perform that task. That is correct. The Department of Municipal Inspections did not direct or ask any individual member either of the board of health or within the offices of the Board of Health to execute on any concern that they may have had about the, the safety or the viability of any food or food product within the Pembroke Public Schools. Is that correct? That is correct. So if both of those things are correct, then the only conclusion that can possibly be drawn is that the action that was taken was one of an, of an individual 
acting as an individual because you do not have the authority of the Board of Health without an actual vote or the majority of the membership be, making a request for that to be acted upon. So it was an individual acting as an individual in a private citizen capacity who used a badge, used it to, to derive some authority from that badge in order to make their way into a school and ask a series of questions that the average resident in town would not ask. My other issue, my other question then, is a matter of public record. Um, there was an illusion made here, or there was something that was alluded to that you have a handbook or you have a Board of Health protocol that clearly you're all given to read that actually said, and in fairness to Mrs. McSweeney, if this is the case and she's following the protocol that you've established, I'd like to see that handbook, I'd like to be able to read through the handbook, and I'd like somebody to direct me to where that language is. I'll have no problem, I'll hand you over the information. No, no, that would be great. Well, I'm okay. assuming that you all have it and that you've all read through it, because I'd like to see where in that handbook it actually stipulates that without a board, without a board vote, without direction of the Department of Municipal Inspectors or the head of the Department of Municipal Inspectors, that you should go off and perform this exact task as an individual and an individual member. If you can provide that, I'll be the first one to publicly apologize to you. I don't think you'll be able to do that. that. Chief, I'm going to provide you with emails um, that have gone on through this when, situation. When it's been on the town hall, they're power back into Email back. You lost email Friday night. They did not come back until Tuesday Tuesday. Night. I sent an email out Tuesday morning saying that the health agent was in touch with, uh, I can give you a copy of that. Yes. I spoke to Gil on the phone Monday, just like I talked to Gary, then I called Gil and said, you know, we're, team is up and running, the show, all that business. And then I called Mr. Miller. And at that time, she verbally did say to me, what about the schools? And I said, I'll check with Lisa, but this is not the first time we've had a strong I'm sure we have protocol to follow. So it, the other thing that just for the three of you, for knowledge for the three of you, um, it is a requirement to enter the building where children know that you all be quarter checked. It's also a requirement that you be escorted within that building, especially if you do not have a quarter check. And it is a further requirement that if you are going to enter in any kind of official capacity, representing the town of Pembroke, the government of the town of Pembroke, or under the authority thereof, that you reach out and that you go through the office of the superintendent, and more preferably the superintendent directly. Just to make sure we're clear, because this could have been very simple, could have been a just, hey, I had no idea, and for whatever reason we thought that this was the appropriate course of action. I'm incredibly concerned, and I will let it go after this, that the facts has been put into um, meeting in, in the meeting minutes that, that you as a board have brought forth are so different than the facts of both the school officials as well as the written report that's been received <coughs> on the incident because a complaint was filed. There's a formal complaint that had to be filed um, in order for this to be executed on. That, that to me is very, very, very concerning. And I have a collective group of people all with the same set of facts and one individual with something very different, that's a concern. And I will leave it at that. Uh, we, we will, this, this is not the last time that this will, we will discuss this at our next meeting. And, and, you know, I understand that the Chief is here talking about the badges, which as I said, Chief, is on the agenda. I'm probably going to hit that next. Um, Thank you. You, but you. you took it from, you and Aaron took it from the point of view of entry into the school, uh, and, and like I said, I wasn't there. How entry was gained. So there's two different issues there. The issue that I have concern with, quite honestly, is we need to be operating, the three of us, on the same page. And I clearly see an issue with that not happening as it relates to the inspection of the school issue. So there'll be... And you'll get me your handbook to Mr. To Mr. Fine, I assume you can send me the handbook if... I believe that Ms. McSweeney will provide you what she stated that gives her authorization to do what she did. Do you, have you read your handbook? 
I have read it. I don't have it 100% No, no, no. That's okay. I just want to make sure that you all have the same materials. Yes, we do. So if you could just send me a copy of the handbook, that would be great. And you're more than happy to reference the section okay. that you believe gives you the ability to You're, do you're welcome Thank to you. stay for a moment because I'm going to move the subject of badges a little forward because they're connected. And uh, I've actually wrote, wrote some notes to myself. And um, I've been on the board for four years. And I think when I first joined the board as a member, I received a member badge. And then I became clerk, and now I have the, the chairman's badge. And I often wondered, although it was nice to hold a badge, I often wondered why I have a badge. And I would say that, you know, when I look at a badge, it's probably one of the most recognizable symbols of authority. We made those points. I feel that that's too easily mistakable. You know, it, it, it's clearly a problem. And I think, along with your thoughts, we need to have a different form of identification. And, you know, given the, the incident that has just occurred over the past week, I'm going to make the following motion before the board that, as of right now, that our three Board of Health badges are immediately surrendered to our town administrator. Second. Right, a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The ayes have it. Motion is passed. And we will turn in our badges effective immediately to the town administrator. I have my badge to turn in. For the record, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, sir. I do not have a badge as I was just recently appointed. So okay. You got his badge. Uh, I um. And do you I, have your badge, Ms. McSweeney? Oh, I, I wasn't sure if that was the police badge right there. Yeah. No, I gave okay. it back. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. Maybe he'd want it later. Okay. So I'm going to take our two badges, turn them over to our town administrator. And I've got the third. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I really appreciate Chairman. it. Thanks for coming in. Chairman. Yes, Sheila. The health agent has asked if you want her badge. Just to have no badges. She has her ID. The, the health agent as someone who is what the I would board, consider... Your, your motion was as board members. Oh, excuse me. Your members were board members. With board members, yes. It had nothing to do with The that. health agent is an inspectional service yes. agent. And, and she, she should have... She, she should have. Yeah. Yes. The motion was for board members to turn in. The Mr. Badge. Newman, would you like to amend the motion? I will amend to be for the record to say uh, that the board members, the board of health members, uh, should turn in their badges. And I will second that amendment. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Nay. The ayes have it. Mr. Chairman? Yes, while, sir. While I'm still here, uh, earlier today, uh, talked to the town administrator about putting together a uh, an ID program and I uh, was wondering if the Board of Health didn't want to put somebody on that board in order to develop a proper ID and get whatever funding we need to to get something legitimate and something that we've all put into so that we have that proper identification for all of our town employees. I would be happy to be part of that board, but I, I don't want to be selfish. I I'm, just, put I'm just going to throw it out there and you can talk no, about it. No, it's a point of information to you too, Chief. Um, I know the town of Weymouth um, ha has somebody that takes your picture. Mm -hmm. I was a former custodian there. You were given a badge and it's all done digitally. Pretty relatively cheap, I would think. They print the pictures, they put them on the badge, and you were to wear them in the schools. So I think that would work. Yeah. I think it wouldn't cost too much, Mr. Minister, you know, uh, Mr. Thorne. Uh, and I think if you put the school through the schools and somebody on the, you know, in it, through the town hall, I think you'd be able to, you know, it wouldn't uh, cost that much because it really involves just an individual, to my knowledge, one individual, paid individual, who goes around and at certain times takes pictures of, if it's teachers, wherever it is, and gets five in a day and comes back and gets another five so that each school is done and each department is done and it shouldn't be too much but and, and it's important too i mean you got yeah. the, the the water department guys that, that go to people's houses and, and so we just really need to do that we need yeah the really the identification needs to be done. and it's more effective i mean back in the day when there was two thousand residents in town everybody knew who did what jobs right so it really was we kind of so a moot point. And, and now that we have 19,700 people, we need to have a face. And uh, so, you know, this we make progress. So while we we're addressing this, if I could go off the beaten path just a second, Mr. Thorne, it, could we potentially get a sign on the health agent's vehicle within the next month? It's been about a year 
since she's been running the around in the car that's um, not identified as the Board of Health? Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Mrs. Thorne. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chief. All right, have a great night. Thank you, Chief. All right. Okay, next on our agenda, we have a program that I started at our last meeting that I have coined Eight to Educate, mm -hmm. which allows an honored speaker, I've given him or her the floor for eight minutes and, and really I've kind of given them carte blanche to open it up and talk about some initiatives that may or may not interest the Board of Health. Uh, we kicked it off two weeks ago by having Mr. Clark from our Conservation Commission, and this week I have inv invited one of our esteemed selectmen, Mr. Lou Stone. And Lou, thank you for coming and participating. So I'm going to get my timer up, and, and I am going to hold you to eight minutes. Could All you right. just give us a sense of what you've chosen to talk about? Well, I thought it might be a good idea to continue along the lines of the schools and what that means to me and what I want to c communicate to the board is that back in 2013 I was contacted by a representative <coughs> of a textile recycling company here in Pembroke and they had a program across the state on uh, recycling uh, clothes and shoes and different items like that that may be damaged enough that they wouldn't uh, go to uh, uh, the uh, regular charity groups that we see around uh, because they really weren't usable. However, they could be recycled. And so what came out of that was uh, a program that I brought forth to the schools because it was geared toward the schools. And uh, I met with the Board of Selectmen and went over the program, and the Board of Selectmen thought it was a good idea. Uh, it didn't cost any money for the town to get into it. And how this program works is uh, at each of the five schools, there is a bin placed available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Also, there is one at the town hall uh, out in the parking lot, and there is one at the recycling center. Uh, people can go there at any time, and they can place clothing that is not going to be worn anymore. Uh, couldn't be used by anybody uh, for the same purpose that it had been used, so it gets recycled. Now, uh, this company right here in Pembroke, uh, they go and they uh, empty the bins every, every week and uh, they uh, weigh the material and if it's uh, something that really uh, is, should have gone in the trash then we don't get any credit for that. And the credit that we get is by the ton. And uh, every month the Board of Selectmen gets a copy of the report for the previous week and uh, the latest report uh, actually goes back uh, to when we started the program in May of 2013. 132 tons of recyclables have been collected and out of that $14,720 have been received by the schools and each school gets their share depending on what was recycled from what went into their bin. Uh, also uh, during the year uh, this company has contests throughout the state pitting one school against the other to see if they have increased their tonnage and uh, Pembroke has got about um, another $500 or so from uh, earnings that they got there. So we're well over $15,000. Now that money, based on each school share, goes to the PTO program, which uh, the schools have complete control over on how they spend that money. I spoke to the superintendent tonight. 
She's extremely pleased with the program, and they have done a lot of good things with the money that they have received. Also, there's another benefit here. The uh, 132 tons of recyclable material may, before this program, have gone into the trash program that we pick up every week at your house. Now, we pay to get rid of trash, and we pay about $56 a ton. So times 132 tons, that's $7,400. It was a cost avoidance. So um, 15, over $15,000 earned, $7,400 cost avoidance. It's a great program. And uh, every month when, when we get the report, it goes by school. So it's like a contest. And the superintendent says it works great because the schools like to compete with each other to see how, much, how many tons of recyclables that they can bring in, and that gives them money that the PTO can spend, which of course goes to the benefit of the students. So it's a great program, doesn't cost us any money, and as I said, we make money and we avoid uh, trash costs. So that was uh, one issue. I don't know how much time I've got left. You have about two and a half minutes, two and a half Mr. Minutes. Stone. Let me go to another subject Alrighty. that I hope everybody is interested in. And that's our solar farm, which is out on the recycling center grounds. Now, that was up and running in December, and it's projected to produce 80% of what the town buildings, including the schools, uh, use for electricity. So that's a great savings to Excuse us. Excuse me, Mr. Stone, you said yes. 80%? Pardon me? You said 80%? 80% of what we currently spend now on electricity for our buildings. So you turn around and use the solar energy that's out there at the old, uh, the, the recycle center. Right. All those panels. Right. They put them into, they put them into energy, and then they'll, they will be able to fuel the, uh, electricity for the... Uh, yeah, what it, what it does is the building. solar panels generate electricity which goes to National Grid. National Grid keeps track of the kilowatt hours uh -huh. and it builds up a credit and the town gets a credit for all of those kilowatt hours. So, uh, and... Uh, it is. What was I going to add to that? Um, yeah. Based on the usage that we get, total from the kilowatt hours produced by the solar panels, uh, the town administrator and the town accountant have broken down what each building is currently using, and that's how we establish where the money goes. Uh, currently, the schools account for 44% of all of the electrical costs that the town has to pay for. So we assign 44% of the savings to the schools. And we break it down building by building. Now, um, the Energy Committee, which we have here in town, which was uh, really involved in getting this solar panel system, along with uh, myself and the town administrator, um, they are also looking into whether we can find another site because if we can save 80%, we should be looking at 100%. So that's an ongoing thing. Um, now, uh, can I just finish? Of course you may. <laughs> of course. Because this is the important part Go of ahead. all of this. Okay? The solar farm project also contributes to the town an annual payment in lieu of taxes of $105,000. Every year we get $105,000 from the company that is the one that put in the solar panels and so forth. Now, um, there's also a lease fee for the property that those solar panels are on, $76,500 every year. And in addition, um, it creates a credit 
to the town for each kilowatt hours of electricity that is produced by those solar panels. And that amounts over 20 years, which is the length of our agreement, to over $7 million. Mm -hmm. The total value to the town over the 20 years from those three ways that we get money is over $10 million, an average of over $500,000 a year. So it's a great deal. We've got to keep looking for these things, and we are doing that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I have a, I have a closing question, a little bit of a comment as well, Mr. Thorne. Uh, Mr. Stone, first of all, thank you for coming in and speaking to our board. Uh, I never want to interject politics on an evening uh, at a Board of Health meeting, but it's my understanding that although you are up for re-election, you have decided not to pursue another term of selectmen. I'd like to say that, uh, speaking for myself, your leadership and your vision will be missed, and I think it will be a loss to have you, although still living in Pembroke but not serving on the board. That being said, a lot of these initiatives that you talked about, maybe you didn't work in them solo, you worked with our town administrator, you worked in the energy committee. If you were to leave us with one passing thought in terms of how you'd like to see Pembroke continue to move forward, something that maybe not that you didn't accomplish, but something you'd like us to see put more of our energy and efforts to, what would that be? I think I would like to uh, send a message out to the public, if I can, humbly asking that if you're really interested in this town and love it like the people here do, that's why you're on this board. That's why I'm on the board of selectmen. I want this town to get even better than it is today. But we need people to participate in our government. We have lots of boards and lots of committees. Even the board of selectmen has their election every single year. We need people who would be willing to donate their time. And the time that they donate would depend on what function it is that they would have an interest in. And we have many projects that we're looking at. So if the public is watching um, <laughs> from my nine, nine years of being on the board and maybe another six or eight years on different other committees and boards, uh, it's been a great run, and it's a great town, and we need to make it even better than it is. Thank you. Thanks very much. We appreciate it. We'll see you around town. Right. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Moving forward. Now, Mr. Thorne, are you pressed for time? Are you, are you still right with us? Now. Okay. Good. So, under all business... I could, if I could just call my colleagues' attention to the top bullet point gang of 13. Mm -hmm. Again, that's something that I jokingly coined several months ago, and, and I'd like to officially, Mrs. Landy, if we could remove that title, Gang of 13, and we're going to rename that Future Initiatives from this point forward. And it, it probably slipped my attention when I was sent the agenda. I'm, look, I'm reading right off of the agenda. It says, Gang of 13, a revised and categorized list the health agent suggests the direction the board should take. So, had I not been bleary-eyed, I, I might have asked, I might have amended that. And what I have done is, I've scratched the final five words which read the direction the board should take. And to me, it should sound something like this. A revised and categorized list the health agents suggest may be noteworthy of consideration by the Board of Health. I actually have a copy of the initiatives that were prepared by the health agent, and I believe our DMI director may have been involved. Would you like me to repeat that, Ms. McSweeney? No, oh. wait a minute. Okay. And I'm going to give it back to you so you that Go I ahead. just got it. Okay. Yep. A revised and category list of the health agent suggests... Uh, maybe noteworthy of the of consideration of the consideration of by the, the board of health by the board of health. Yep, and I'm going to distribute a copy of that list, Mr. Newman. Thank you. 
and Ms. McSweeney. So what I'm, I'm going to do is, it, it probably wouldn't be fair of me to give either one of you a homework assignment, but what I would like the two of you to do is, in the course of uh, now and our next meeting two weeks from now, if you folks could take a look at that, digest it a little bit, and we're going to discuss this list in detail at our next meeting in terms of prioritizing. Mm -hmm. uh, I certainly, this is not a list that I'm saying the end all be all. Both of you and myself included may want to add some items. So we're going to spend some time talking about that and prioritizing the list. So I hope you don't mind the assignment. Not at all. Okay. Next under old business we have the report of cost of engineering appearing for routine variances. I'm actually going to ask Mrs. Landy, if you could come forward, and I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about that, if you wouldn't mind. I don't have my notes. I have it right here. You can, you can use my copy. So, we normally have been asking engineers to come in for what we call um, minor variances, you know, not where there's no a butter notification to come in, you know, I mean, and a butter notification requires the engineer to be here because we're not engineers and we cannot answer the questions that the neighbors might ask. So, um, I just did some checking around to the, the five that I listed to see what do they charge the resident or the, you know. To come here. Yeah, to come here to talk about, um, you know, whatever the variance is. Because sometimes they just show up and, it, and it's a minor when I say like reducing the setback from 10 feet to 8 feet. Mm -hmm. from the foundation to the septic tank, right? things like that. Obviously, if it's more complex, we need them. So, uh, land planning said all our, our appearances require an, are an additional charge, and they include charges for travel time. Now, they said some anywhere from 50 to 150 bucks an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, Webby Engineering, uh, when it requires a budding notif or butter notification, they build it into the cost of the plan. And passed on to the homeowner. And passed on to the homeowner. Sure. But he does not charge for other minor variances. Um, these are, and each of these engineers told me that these are variances that other towns allow the health agent to sign off on. They don't even bring it up in front of the board, you know, because it's if it gets by the review engineer. Well, if it's going in front of uh, Mr. Perma. Right. And then it's going back in front of the health agent. The only thing I'd really like to see on that is to see the the chain of events on the property. Um, I just to have a synopsis. So, so just yeah, you, you know, right. of there what was the a property variance, is, maybe a variance, um, and you know the protocol that goes along with it, just so that we're appraised of the properties themselves. Okay. Okay. Other than that, um, if there's any special um, limitations to it then maybe we should discuss whether or not we really need um, Grady to come in or Mr. Glo McGlone or um, say, it should be pretty cut and dry. The last one we had was um, I think uh, Perma recommended that they extend the impervious membrane for Correct. 20 feet. And so if you've got like Mr. Primer um, doing his engineering report and then we've got the health agent that's going out to the site and everything's coinciding, Wonderful. Okay. Just a report on what's going on. Okay. Are so you in agreement the there, Mr. Ge Mr. Fine? I'm actually not, Ms. McSweeney, and I'll, I'll give my two cents. And perhaps I'm, I'm old school, and, and I'm certainly one who, who likes to say old procedures or old, new technology. So I, I agree we need to constantly be getting better moving, moving forward, looking at how we can be more efficient. I feel very strongly not just as chair, but as someone who sat on the board for over four years, I very much appreciate, and I'm not an engineer, but I very much appreciate when the variances actually come before the board. My issue is, and, and I don't believe that we want to, not that anyone would even think about a motion, but I'm not thinking about actually requesting that an engineer comes before us with every single variance because that would be born upon the homeowners of Pembroke. So that's not where I'm going. What I'm thinking about, and I say this to my two colleagues, is I strongly believe that our health agent, Mrs. Cullity, should not only be present to present the health agent report, 
that she should be present as as more of an expert than I, and I'm not going to say more of an expert than the two of you, but she's more of an expert than I. I feel very strongly that when a variance comes before the board, that our health agent, as in years past, has, has kind of given a synopsis and presented it. Uh, I know that I can sleep at night when I have approved a variance that I might be a little shaky on, that the health agent has has spoken and reviewed. Okay, so th but that's something that I would like to see continued, but I'm, I'm up for the rest of the board. Mr. Fine, that, that is in your control and that is in your power uh, as far as the health agent appearing at the board, at the board meetings. And there's, uh, there's nothing that would stop her from appearing at the board meetings. Well, our, our DMI director is here, and I'm not, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but we have had conversations in the past, Mr. Thorne, more than he cares to, to admit to. But I have made numerous requests about our health agent, and I'm thrilled, by the way, for the record, that our health agent came to our meeting tonight, and her, her uh, eloquent of speaking about the, the whole Storm Riley and going over the report was valuable invaluable so I'm thrilled that she came and I'd like to see her present for not only the health agent report but through the conclusion of the meeting but if you have any I don't want to put you on the spot well, I mean I uh, you know I definitely am taking that under advisement as to the wishes of the board okay and and also I have spoken to so my board knows I have again had numerous cons cons conversations with Mr. Thorne, and I have suggested to him, because I don't think I can tell you, but I have suggested that while our health agent isn't present, that Mr. Thorne should be here as the director of DMI, and he has acquiesced and he is here. Which has created a problem, because we have changed our meeting time from 6.30, which is a normal hour for board meetings for people that do work, to 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock is not a good time for this board to meet. So unless we can correct, or you and Mr. Thorne can collect, correct the situation of the health agent returning back to her position, um, I am going to say at this point that the meetings need to be consistent with 6.30 and the Monday night evenings and the coinciding with the Board of Selectmen that we passed last year. Well, to that, Ms. McSweeney, I have changed our meeting times till five o'clock on Mondays and they will continue five o'clock on Mondays un until the elections and the board reorganizes and then, Mr. The, Fun, then, I want then the chair then the chair next year or the chair after the elections can revisit that it is very important that Mr. Thorne as the DMI director be present and on I on what authority have you changed our meeting time on, you have not done it with the board. I have I have done it as the acting chair, which I am entitled to do. Okay, fine. Thank you for clarifying that. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, next up on the agenda we actually have, thank you, Sheila. Thank you. We have words from our DMI director, and, and I didn't have anything particular, Mr. Thorne. I think I put that on the agenda along with Mrs. Landy, just if, if you had anything that you wanted to share with the board or comment on any of the issues that we have brought forth no, this I'll evening. Be I'll be happy to come before the board in two weeks when the board reviews your uh, future initiatives. Okay. Because I see that there are things here that impact the town organization as a whole, as well as the Department of Municipal Inspections and the Board of Health. So I'm looking forward to meeting with, with the board uh, in two weeks when you discuss this particular item. Excellent. Great. Thank you. And we have already talked about the badges, so I went a little bit out of order. So I'm going to ask if anyone has a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Mr. Newman seconded. Mrs. McSweeney went aye. All right.